Hello, I'm Riganka Awati, Senior Writer at Editage Insights. Uh, to celebrate International Open Access Week this year, uh, we've invited several experts from the scholarly communications industry to talk about open access. And um, I have with me here Stephanie Feldman, who is the head of open research at Drill, and Dominique Guru, vice president of marketing at Drill. Uh, Stephanie, Dominique, thank you so much for doing this interview. So I'm going to begin with a question that many researchers, especially early career researchers, have, which is uh, you know whether publishing results in open access journals has a tangible impact and how it can benefit them. Yeah, I am happy to tell a bit more about that. Um, uh, I think one of the things that everyone thinks about when you talk about open access is, first of all, of course, that because it is openly available, uh, uh, articles um, uh, are much more visible, they are downloaded much more often, um, uh, and also they are downloaded um, uh, really uh, across the globe. So the, the, what we have seen at Brill is that open access articles tend to be uh, downloaded up to 10 times more often than sort of similar articles that are not uh, open access. Um, and of course, that is really a big benefit to everyone. But I think especially if you are a young researcher or an early career researcher and you're seeking to, yeah, to really um, uh, make a name for yourself in, in your field and to make an impact. Um, of course, also um, uh, citations. Um, uh, not only can you get more citations, uh, studies have shown that open access usually results in sort of two to three times more citations. But because it's openly available, your article is also cited um, uh, more quickly after publication. There's not, not such a delay as you would maybe otherwise uh, see. So that's, of course, also really uh, important when you think about communicating your research to uh, your peers. The theme for this year's Open Access Week is open for climate justice. So um, how can open access publishing accelerate climate research and climate action and more specifically promote climate justice? I can uh, tell a little bit about that. Of course, through open access, we can reach a much wider uh, audience, also beyond academia. And in these sort of wicked problems that are very complex uh, and that go across different industries, it's really important to collaborate broadly across industries. And that's uh, uh, an area where open access can really play a, a big role and can stimulate innovation. And within real, we find uh, the sustainable development goals, including climate change, extremely uh, important. We believe that the research that we publish that that contributes to today's global questions like climate change um, and through open access and gaining a wider audience that way, um, that can really stimulate a broader discussion. I think, you know, there are two, uh, two things that are uh, uh, quite striking here. One is you've mentioned that, you know, uh, publishing in open access journals can especially help early career researchers because you know they are trying to establish themselves in their field so uh publishing open access gets them more visibility and it, it might also help them get cited better uh plus you know there are compelling reasons of course to publish climate research open access but one of the barriers that early career researchers may face is uh the lack of funding uh when you know the open access journal that they uh, would like to publish in uh, you know, if they have article processing charges. So, uh, how can uh, uh, so how can researchers overcome this barrier? Yeah, this is of course one of the the, the key issues here with open access. And um, uh, I think at Brill, um, uh, we have always also experienced this issue because we uh, publish a lot in the social sciences and humanities, and in these fields, funding for publications has always been really much more scarce. Um, but also we really believe in um, um, transitioning to open access together with other stakeholders. So not just funders, but also libraries. So what we are really focused on is models that really allow us to work with all of these stakeholders instead of just simply uh, charging authors uh, a fee. Um, and one of the key models that we uh, uh, have implemented that we really believe will, will uh, drive this change is what we call um, a read and publish agreement or an transformative agreement where we really work with our library customers to transform you know, the relationship that we had with them before for subscriptions into open access publishing. Um, and we see that this will really make a key difference um, uh, because it really allows us to directly work with institutions. And also in these um, uh, agreements, what is really key is that 
authors don't have to pay and they have access to open access <laughs> uh, automatically. Um, uh, so that is really, uh, uh, really hurdle free for, for the author. Um, another thing is that we really work with authors to identify funding, to source funding. Um, there are budgets available. Sometimes you have to be a bit creative or you have to think a little bit outside of the box, perhaps. Um, so that is also uh, something that, that, that we do. For instance, a good example is that we have a couple of open access journals, uh, which are based on sort of crowdfunding also from libraries and from uh, societies in the field. So that is another model that uh, that yeah helps us to publish in open access without um, uh, charging authors. And in addition to that, we also have a program where we uh, can waive open access fees, especially for researchers in developing countries. That's part of our CSR program. Um, and I think another important aspect to mention is that it's not just about the actual article and uh, uh, making sure that that's uh, available in open access, but we're also making sure that the knowledge of that research is available in a wide format. And we also do that in different ways. For example, we do podcast interviews with uh, the researchers that are creating uh, these articles to talk about, well, how does their work impact the world today? What do people need to know about it? And that really reaches a much wider audience because we want to share these research as widely as possible. Could you talk a little bit? So you, you mentioned that, you know, um, there are also so many other things that you're doing to ensure that uh, climate research or any research basically gets out faster and in open formats. Um, so uh, books and book chapters are, of course, another uh, books are one format. And uh, that's that's the next thing I want to ask you. Could you could you talk a little bit about publishing books? Or book chapters open access um how does that work whether it's different from you know how publishing articles in research papers uh, uh, sorry publishing research papers in open access journals how is how is that different from uh, how research publishing works um so maybe a little bit about that and if you could also talk about it from other perspectives like you know uh, education and accessibility to the general public or, you know, for authors, if, if they're considering publishing books open access, then, you know, um, does the funding differ? Uh, so maybe you could you could cover some of these. Yeah, I would be more than happy to because uh, Braille is uh, 300 years old and uh, books have always been in these 300 years, a really important part of our, uh, our program and they continue to be. Um, and I think that's directly links to the fields that we operate in, the humanities and the social sciences, of course, it's really important to remember that there the book, the long format is still really uh, the key format to disseminate research. So it is really important that we don't forget about books and that books are also included in uh, yeah, the transition to, to open access. Um, uh, uh, we have also, uh, therefore, already since 10 years, we uh, are publishing open access books and we really are proactive in having a conversation with authors um, what we find is really key is to have this conversation early in the publication process already uh, to allow authors to um, think about funding um, uh, and think about maybe uh, applying for funding as well. There are actually some budgets uh, available. There is also um, there are also and there are also good tools um, uh, available. Uh, there is, for instance, what is called the Open Access Books Toolkit. Um, which is um, uh, hosted by uh, OAPEN. OAPEN is a, a very important uh, database of uh, open access books. Um, and so they have done some work to really, yeah, uh, make it easy for authors to find information about open access book publishing. Um, so early on in the process, uh, but also again, yeah, what we want to do is be a bit creative and really help think with authors, you know, uh, what, what, what do you want to do? Um, uh, how can we open up this book? Um, another aspect is that we also um, uh, work with authors who have received um, research grants uh, and research grants um, uh, usually these days also uh, require, in fact, open access publishing. Uh, so we also work with authors to ensure that when they have a research grant that they actually budget uh, for open access publishing um, uh, there. Um, I think with books, what we also really try to do, and that is that is the same for articles, maybe even more so for books, you see that um, um, it is still important uh, that libraries are also involved because they really have to be catalogued by uh, by libraries. Um, so that is another uh, uh, that is another topic that we really um, uh, that we really hope to to provide to to authors. But maybe Dominique can tell a little bit about that uh, too. 
Yeah, of course, within the marketing department, we also uh, promote the open access books uh, widely and we try to maximize the visibility and the discovery ability through all of the regular ways. We make sure that it's available in libraries, that it's indexed there, uh, but also there are uh, databases like JSTOR and AWAPEN uh, and we make sure that they're accessible there. And I already mentioned a little bit that we also try to generate attention in through other ways, like, for example, podcasts that are reaching a wider audience uh, to, to networks like that, or video interviews, or plain language summaries around themes like climate change, where we try to bring all of the different research around this together uh, and uh, provide it in a format that is accessible to, uh, to a lot of people, not to, to make it really uh, broadly known. I was wondering if you're aware of any you know differences in the adoption of the, the open access publishing uh, any geographical differences in the adoption of uh, open access publishing uh, among researchers yeah that's a really good question um uh, it's true that uh, it has traditionally been more the global north let's say where you know the topic i think because uh, here quite early on already uh, funders really started to think about you know, they really uh, required that um, uh, when you have funding, the funding also needs to be, the results need to be available in open access. And that really pushed, uh, drove, has driven open access for, for some time. So in terms of publishing, we do see that. At the same time, you do also now more and more, it's quite clear, of course, that, uh, you know, this, this topic of, yeah, let's say equitability, that we all not just want to have access to reading research, but we also all want to have access to publishing, of course. And that is, of course, a, a concern with, especially with APC-based publishing, that, yeah, it's only available to authors who have uh, the funding. Um, so there is now more and more, you know, attention for that. Dominique also mentioned it just now, that, that we really try to think about how can we be as inclusive as possible as a publisher, um, uh, also of, you know, the, the Global South, developing economies, uh, and really, and that's, you know, Brill is thinking about that, but also the wider industry is really uh, uh, taking steps to, 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 yeah, to mitigate that and to ensure that we remain uh, indeed inclusive um, uh, as we are now, I would say. What are the trends, if you're aware of any, what are the geographic trends in open access mandates? Like, uh, you know, uh, the recent OSTP mandate in the US, for instance, that was one, but are you aware of, uh, you know, any uh, notable geographic differences in terms of uh, whether there are open access mandates? Yeah, that's also an interesting question. In Australia now, uh, the uh, Health Council there has also actually re just really recently, just last week, uh, adopted such an, uh, quite similar to OSTP, the, the US mandate, they adopted a similar mandate. So that is in Australia, where you really now see an acceleration maybe of, of this kind of uh, policy. Um, um, but it does differ, I have to say. I mean, even in Europe, I mean, I think we all sort of assume that in Europe, you know, where this all started, it's now really firmly embedded. But actually, even in Europe, there are countries who are still not really, uh, uh, yeah, so so um, uh, interested in yeah providing these these mandates, and they really come at it from from a bit of a different angle. So I think this difference will be there for some time. If you look at South America, for instance, that's also interesting. Is there? is an interest in open access there, but it has really taken a bit of a different route in that they have really established their own publication platforms. You. So, you know, that are really quite specific to, you know, also, of course, Spanish language um, uh, for a big part, but also quite specific to a certain country or a certain field. Um, uh, so that is also, uh, yeah, that you do see that there are different routes in, in being taken. Um, at the same time, um, um, there is... A, a, you do see if you look at the overall number of open access articles then versus you know the number of closed articles uh, open access articles do continue to grow and now and now actually last year for the first time they surpassed so it's i think now 55 percent open access versus 45 percent closed so that is of course really interesting that you do see that that trend mm -hmm.